Truth to Power by James Olson. There's this little saloon you'll find up and running and packed with patrons before most of us are ready for our morning coffee. The joint's two subway levels beneath the streets of downtown Metropolis. Step out at the Schuster stop on the southbound side, take two lefts, walk maybe 15 feet and you're right on top of it. But you could just as easily walk right past it and never know it was there. There's no sign up, not even a door. Just a dark hallway that looks like a good place for a murder. Take a breath. Follow the cigarette stink and the bluesy jukes box sounds inside. It's a tolerable little gin mill. Get there before the morning rush and you're likely to find a stool. Your first clue that there's something wrong about this place is the bartender. You'll never forget his face. He's a hulk of a guy who's seen way too much. A broken man with laser red eyes. His forehead's a fractured cantilever, an avalanche waiting to happen. His skin's gone a little gray from its natural chartreuse. He's got a voice like Coke bottles getting ground up under a door. His name is Jones. He says he's from Mars, and nobody tells him he's nuts. Not one of these sad old bar flies. It's not that they're scared of him either. They've seen and done things that are supposed to be impossible. They're not the kind to out and out brag about being able to bench press cars or run faster than a speeding bullet or jump up into the air and stay there. Nah, not these guys. These guys, they've got nothing to prove. Been there, done that. Except for old Snapper, always at the same stool at the end, living up to his nickname, snapping his fingers in time to the music and rattling on and on and on about the mighty powers globe-spanning adventures, nefarious world conquerors, you name it. He never stops snapping his damn fingers, and he never stops sucking back the sauce and jabbering about the old days, the glory days, the golden age, he calls it, the age of heroes. And all the other old farts, they grunt and nod and grumble at each other, swapping old jokes they've swapped a thousand times, even fat, Beat red old penguin chirps out a curse or two before bursting into tears. Then they get talking, and if you've got half a brain, you listen. They talk about amazing adventures, sounding like a bunch of retired car mechanics the whole time. They talk about a man of steel, an Amazon princess, but they never talk about the mean one, the cruel one. The one who couldn't fly or bend steel in his bare hands. The one who scared the crap out of everybody and laughed at all the rest of us for being the envious cowards we were. No, they never talk about him. Say his name and watch Dibney's face sag so bad his jaw hits the bar. Not a man among them wants to hear about Batman. Was he quietly assassinated? Or did he just decide we weren't worth the grief? The question hangs in the air for a moment or two, then Jones springs for a round for everybody and himself. They get talking again about the old days, the glory days. They remember. They were right there in the thick of it back then. It wasn't so long ago. We had heroes. Welcome back to my channel, or welcome for the first time if you are just now joining me. My name is David, and today I am talking about none other than the Dark Knight Returns. Now, a little bit about me. My comic book reading history is very minimal. I've dabbled here and there a little bit. I've picked up a couple of uh, graphic novels and a couple of issues of comics in my time and have read through a few of them, but by and large... My knowledge of DC Marvel comes from films and TV shows and cartoons. And I'm setting out to change some of that. So I found a list of 10 essential DC and 10 essential Marvel comic storylines to read. And this, friends, is the first one that I decided to pick up and read. Because I know there are a couple of channels who have recently read this and talked about this and have made multiple videos breaking down each and every part of this four-part storyline. And I've avoided all of those videos intentionally because I wanted to read this first. And I have finished The Dark Knight Returns, and I have 
thoughts on this. Now, you may notice it is the 30th anniversary edition. So this is an older comic. This, I believe, 30th anniversary edition was published in 2016. So that puts this pretty old. Not old in terms of the comic timeline, but old to our modern standards. And so we get spoiled by some of the things, such as the, the visuals that we get to see. Now, some of them are decent visual panels. You know, I, I, I'm a fan of this particular one of Batman, among others. But others are not so great. There are spots in here where I'm just... It's almost cringeworthy. I'm trying to find one of those really bad ones here. To where it's just... I, I, I don't get it. I mean, it's stylistic, I guess. But this isn't the best example. But it's... The, the artwork in here is hit and miss. It feels like the, the full page panels are great and outstanding. And they come in through there. And then you get ones that are just mediocre and you have some that are in between and I mean granted it all lines up together it's consistent it's not like you can look at it and say hey there's a whole bunch of different artists but th th this sort of paneling where it's got the, the text and then the image and a lot of this kind of news reporting dialogue I, I didn't like that either as a way of furthering the storyline but the basic premise in this is that Batman's been retired for about 10 years. Nobody knows what happened to him. He just, poof, disappeared. Now, Bruce Wayne has still been around, and nobody has made the connection that Bruce Wayne and Batman are the, the one and the same. But uh, with the disappearance of Batman, most of his rogues gallery of villains kind of disappeared too. Um, and a few of them make a reappearance after Batman comes back in this. Uh, which poses an interesting question. Which one creates the other? Did Batman being around create those supervillains? The Joker, the Penguin, the Riddler, Two-Face, all of those. If there had been no Batman, would there have been such a problem in Gotham? And that that's one of the questions I think it tries to grapple with in here, and I think it does a pretty good job of that overall. One thing that you will notice as you're reading through this is you get a lot of reminders that Batman is old. Lots and lots and lots of times Batman is having that inner monologue of, whew, I almost missed that one, I'm getting slower. Oh man, that would have wouldn't have grazed me 10 years ago, but now it hurts. You know, Little little reminders that he's he's an old guy, and uh, I think at one point in time it puts him at about forty nine for his age, which is not that old of a guy. But I guess in superhero standards, that probably is pretty old and grizzled. I imagine that sort of weight kind of bears down upon you as you're fighting crime and dealing with all of these things. So. I don't want to talk too deep into here. You'll see familiar faces that will pop up throughout, including some late surprises, especially in the fourth act. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised when I, I pieced together a name and who that character was before they actually showed up with uh, one of their signature tricks that they are capable of doing um, to assist Batman in a way. I won't even tell you who he ends up fighting in the third and fourth acts because I don't want to spoil anything because those characters aren't really present in the first half. The The original problem, the reason Batman comes back, is there's a gang in town called the Mutants, and they've been pretty much running roughshod over everything. Uh, Commissioner Gordon's about to retire. He's going to be replaced. Uh, but at the beginning, Commissioner Gordon is still there. He's still in Batman's corner, even though Batman arguably is a little grittier and darker than usual. Um, there, there are moments in here where it becomes questionable as to his methods, and I think that's probably something that is pretty common in Batman. I don't know uh, in his storybooks. Now, there's 
it, it's clearly mentioned in here. At times, it reminds us that he doesn't cross that line, that he knows when he can, he needs to hold back some, and other times when he can just really go all out because they've got body armor and all this other protection on. But there are definitely questionable choices in here. Especially when we get to that third act and how that resolves and how it opens up into the fourth act of things. And I imagine that's probably one of the things that really excites fans of the DC and Batman in particular comics is grappling with some of those questions of Batman, his methods, has he gone too far? Is he losing a step in his old age? Is he causing the problems by being here and being an active part of things? Um, but anyway, the, the gang of mutants, they're in town, and somebody needs to deal with it. And so Batman comes back to help deal with this problem. And you think early on that he has dealt with this problem. I will tell you, the mutants are present throughout the entire thing. Now, there are parts of that gang that might fade into the distance as things go along, but uh, they still have a role to play throughout the entire arc. And not just a minor one. They they step in and take up a pretty major plot role later on in the story. Now, overall, I did enjoy this. I was leaning towards about three to three and a half stars going into the fourth act. I enjoyed probably the last part of the book more than the rest of it combined. Um, I think it wrapped up in, in a way that was really fitting for this, and that bumped me to more of the three-and-a-half to four-star range on this comic. Now, it's not my favorite that I've ever read, and it's not going to be. Um, I, I understand its importance. I'm sure the people that read it when it came out probably have fond memories of it, have, like the art style, like the storytelling, have some nostalgia tied into it. Uh, all in all, it was it was good. It was okay. It might even have been great at moments, but as a whole, it was not the greatest of all time. Was it the top ten? Maybe. I'm excited to find out. I'm excited to see how it stacks up to the other nine DC, because it's not fair to compare the DC to the Marvel and vice versa. But I'm excited to see how it's going to hold up, and I'm excited to figure out probably sometime... Uh, this week, what my next comic read is going to be. I'm going to have to see what my local libraries have because the only graphic novel I have on my shelf I'll be reading in September, and that's uh, volume one of Kill Shakespeare. I just don't own any of them, so I'm relying on local libraries, and I've got 19 to choose from. I'll probably go with the Marvel storyline if I can uh, and, and pick up one of those. Probably go with uh, one that is either highly regarded or one that I just don't do much with uh, to, to deepen my comic understanding. So maybe something with Fantastic Four might be a good choice for me. But uh, thank you for watching. I've, uh, I enjoyed reading this. I enjoyed actually having something coming out on Comic Wednesday. So if you have not found Michael K. Vaughn and Steve Donahue, shame on you go subscribe to both of their channels because Comic Book Wednesday, today both of them will be talking about a Marvel epic collection to be determined. I don't know what it'll be, but uh, I've enjoyed it for two weeks in a row that they've been doing this, and I hope that they continue to do so for a long, long time. Go check them out, and uh, be sure to like and subscribe.